When's the last time you did drugs? <laughs> I've never done a drug in my life. Wow. What? Not surprising. He does not never, drink either. Never, never tasted alcohol, never done pot, never tra- tried any drug in my life other than wow. you know an aspirin or a Tylenol. Really? In all your travels huh. uh, and meetings with indigenous yeah. people, you never sat around a campfire and they gave you a plate of something that you're like, wow, this has a funny yeah. effect on me. Uh, no, they've given me plates of stuff that uh, the only effect they had on me might be going to vomit, but other than that, no. Yeah, have you ever been tempted? Because I can't imagine you even being tempted, and if that temptation arose, it would be uh, a lot, uh, you know, in high school or something, not now. You know, I, I haven't been tempted, and it's because I think I know I have a very addictive personality, right. and I, I would be one of those people that if I, something I really liked, it would be hard for me not to do it again. So um, I don't want to. I don't want to dip my toes in that water. Addictive personality is, uh, do you associate it or link it at all to the way that you were passionate about animals where your passion was extreme from very early in life? None of the other kids were like you when it came to caring about animals, correct? No, but you meant no one, you meant no one your age who was in the world you were in, correct? That's true. I was called the nerd, the weirdo, all that kind of stuff because I was so infatuated with animals but that that's true and it you know maybe it is that part of my personality i just you know i'm one of these people who go all in and that's it do you remember the start of all that like the roots of your animal love and fascination do you remember the very earliest age that that grabbed you yeah it was a squirrel that came up to me in my backyard in new york city uh and and took a peanut out of my hand and i thought my god this this squirrel is my friend and I looked at its big eyes and I just thought to myself, this is a special animal. And then I got to bond with the other squirrels and I got them to all come in. Then I got the pigeons. And um, it was just like, you know, it was like, I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I was such a gawky kid. I was so tall and gangly, um, even as a young boy, five, six, seven years old, um, that, uh, you know, I had friends and animals. The squirrel, was that a process or the first time it came and grabbed a peanut or you were trying to lure it, tempt it over time? I remember sitting in my backyard and again, I must have been five or six years old. I know this is going to sound crazy to a lot of people. Uh, And I remember the squirrel kind of walking up to me. Uh, It didn't immediately take the peanut out of my hand, but uh, I remember I would go in the yard every day and it would get closer and closer. And then that day when it took the peanut out of my hand, I said, oh, wow, this is. And then from then on, it would wait for me and come down and very willingly come up and take whatever I had in my hand out. Probably not the right thing for me to do, but it was something that created a bond. I have never asked you about this, but can you sort of articulate for us the spiritual and soulful connection that you have to animals beyond, like you have legitimate relationships with animals, but is there a way for you to articulate why and how you care the way you do? You know, the way I can put it in in, in terms that everybody I think can relate to is anybody who's had a dog, you know, you, you leave all day for work, all day, and you have a miserable day at work, and your dog is home alone all day. Uh, and instead of when you come to the door, the dog looks at you like, I can't believe you left me home all day alone. That dog comes up to you like you're the greatest thing that's in its life at that time. I always say to myself, I want to be the person my dog thinks I am. Um, well, you get that from animals in general. I think animals have this this sense about knowing good people. You know, I, I'll tell you, I, there's a bunch of people that have said, you know, I don't, uh, I don't trust people who don't like animals. If somebody says to me, I hate animals, I hate, that's somebody I've got to keep an arm's length from because it just frightens me. I just think, I don't know how you can be that way. Um, you know, I, and I understand people have had some bad experiences with animals, but I, I hope they also understand that those bad experiences probably stem from bad experiences presented to those animals by people in the first place. Um, so there's something, there's something pure clean and honest about animals that uh, in a world today, sometimes I find a hard time trusting some people, you know, especially when you get more in the public eye, I think you wonder what people want, what people are asking for, what people are, you know, you never wonder that with animals because they don't care what the hell you do. They just care about you. And I just think, I just think that, you know, they haven't a way of knowing that even with wild animals and you know i don't want to give the the wrong impression or go out and oh my gosh you're going to see a you know a florida panther in your yard and go out there and try to feed it a chicken because it's going to love you no no don't do anything stupid like that but i mean you can see things just in some therapies what they do with their horses with kids with dolphins with you know kids with uh, autistic children how animals sometimes seem to know you can see that in people with domestic dogs you know you can see how sometimes if an adult is a jerk to the dog the dog's going to 
you know, and yet you see a baby come by and I'm pull that dog's ears and do all, and the dog just knows, listen, it's a baby. Um, you know, again, there are exceptions to all of this. It's just in my general experience, I've seen things in animals that I wish I saw more of in people. Speaking of dogs, uh, Ron, uh, my wife wants a dog, but I'm looking for a dog that's not going to shed. So what's the best dog I can get for a house with a child that doesn't oh, shed? Oh, he's going to go miniature, miniature schnauzer. Miniature schnauzer, brother. Yeah. Miniature schnauzer is the absolute, I, you know, I know I'm biased because my miniature schnauzer was like our third child. Uh, I've never known a dog that knew children better, tolerated things more, didn't shed, didn't have any bad habits. I mean, this dog was, my, my wife kept saying, I'm looking for the zipper to take the fur off to find a little boy inside. Um, that dog, a good miniature schnauzer, is one of the greatest dogs you could ever have. Ron, which animal do you imagine would most like drugs? <laughs> any animal. What do you mean? Like drugs. Any animal would like drugs if given the opportunity to have them because Generally speaking, they don't know better. You see animals get addicted to things. You know, I talk about the amarula tree in Africa that produces this fruit that ferments into an alcohol that gets animals drunk. And sure enough, the baboons, the elephants, they learn about that. And every year that season when those amarula fruits are coming down, they'll get there and they just suck it up until they're basically plastered. Um, so that's a drug, you know, that, that once an animal can learn to, to get that feeling, it's, it's just a natural, I think, a natural response. You want more. So you get addicted. Ron, in ancient Roman mythology, Romulus and Remus were raised by a wolf. So going back to the topic of, of dogs being part of your family, would it be possible for a wolf or a dog to raise babies as their own and, and like, add them to their pack? Well, logistically, no, unless that baby was already weaned because the carnivore cannot produce the type of milk that would sustain a baby, an infant. Um, the wolf would not produce the, the, that milk needed for the infant. Now, if it was to find a child that had been weaned and was already on solid foods, um, I've seen stranger things. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's that it's impossible. It's improbable, but I'm not going to say it's impossible that it could be taken into a pack and fed and brought food and the, the, the child could learn to feed. I know that's been taken to extremes in some films, but um, I do think that there is a maternal instinct in some animals to adopt things. I've seen that with lions and antelope that they eat. You know, an antelope, unfortunately, they, they couldn't feed the antelope, okay? They, they, they protected the antelope, but they couldn't feed, and the antelope ended up starving to death. Um, but the maternal instinct was there to protect the antelope, to, to be next to it all the time, something that they normally would eat. So, you know, animals, I think, never cease to surprise us. Ron, I read that the oldest male gorilla in the world passed away yesterday at the Atlanta Zoo. Um, it was 61 years old. My question would be, how do the aging process of animals that get that old mirror ours? Almost exactly the same. You know, you start doing things like you might start losing teeth. You get a tooth infection that can lead to, you know, a fatal disease. You start losing your eyesight. You lose your your reflexes, your instincts, your strength. Um, you you lose that, that 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 body texture that you had. And something like a gorilla, that's incredibly necessary, you know, to, to survive in the wild that way. That's why that animal probably lived a lot longer under human care than it would have lived in the wild. Um, so these animals, the same geriatric processes that you see in human beings happen in animals, which is why most animals live longer under human care than they do in the wild, because they're catered to for that. You know, in the wild, if you if if you lose your strength and you can't hunt anymore, you're going to starve. But in human care, you presented the food, you're catered to that way, you provided medications to help, you know, ease pain for extreme arthritis, which is something that's very common in animals uh, that can be debilitating and in fact fatal in many, many instances. So you'll, you'll see the same geriatric processes in animals as you see in humans. What you don't see is you don't see animals um, reflecting those things. They don't demonstrate pain. They don't demonstrate, um, you know, being compromised out of instinct. They'll disguise those things because they know once they show that they're going to be predated on by something else. They're going to be outcompeted by something else. So by the time you see an animal in the wild having a bad limp or being slow and not having a, it's usually very far along in that degenerative process.
I want to read something to you from the New York Times. A female monkey in a nature reserve in Japan violently overthrew the alpha male of her troop to become the first female leader in the reserve's 70-year history. She presides over 677 monkeys, but a messy love triangle could endanger her status. What's happening there? Well, uh, you know, uh, the female of all species is starting to, uh, well, not starting to in many ways already for a long time, has understood that, you know, they're, they're just as powerful, just as important, and uh, many times have the ability to lead as well or better than males. And um, this is something that is, I think, being found across species lines. There are several species of animals where they are uh, uh, maternal, they, they are matriarchal. You know, hyenas, for instance, it's the females that are larger than the males. They, they, they run the show. Birds of prey, it's the females that are larger than the males. They, they're the ones usually just make the, the big decisions. Um, you know, so to see this in a primate now, it's not terribly unlike what we see in humans. You know, for, the, for too long a time, I think that uh, females were, were not given the equal credit that, that they deserved as, 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 as men get the credit. Um, and perhaps you're seeing this evolve now in, in some of the lower species of primates also. So this is something that I think is just, it's an evolution of survival. The survival of the fittest, which not doesn't always necessarily mean the strongest, but it could also mean the smartest. Intelligence uh, is just as important as strength. Fascinating. Put it on the <laughs> poll, Guillermo. Did you know that the Me Too movement had arrived in the monkey kingdom as well? Ron, have you heard about hamsters in Hong Kong where they're rounding up hamsters and killing them because one of them tested positive for COVID? So now they have kind of like, it sounds like a secret underground situation where people are fostering hamsters to keep them alive. <laughs> I had not heard about that. Oh. It seems to be an extreme knee jerk reaction to something. Um, but, you know, again, p panic is one of these things. Panic, misinformation, being misunderstood uh, leads to these kinds of tragic responses. Um, I hope it's not something that uh, will continue. Um, but, you know, the fact is animals do uh, are able to get COVID. Uh, we've seen that in several species, but, um, you know, what would be that thought process if people thought that about human beings? Guillermo, put this on the poll as well. Are animals more pure, cleaner, more honest, and better than humans? I want to get to Ron McGill's top five. Well, that last one, better than humans. Now, I, that, that, take that word out. Leave the rest in there, and I think the poll would be incredibly one-sided. I mean, they lick their butts and their wieners. I mean, well, we and you would, would do the same would if you could. Too. I <laughs> would. You're right. <laughs> I you, can't you, reach. I tried. You, you more right than now. most. You more than most. And Joe Rogan says he could. Joe Rogan oh, says, get he, he says, he's he so, says a lot of stuff. He says like. he's so flexible that he could. So you <laughs> I want to get a top five list from you here, Ron, on animals unusual animals that you have just felt like this animal can tell I am a good person. This animal trusts me and I'm surprised that it trusts me because you've also found yourself in some danger for, for misreading some of those situations. Have you not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, that I, 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 I think you've been here and I've, I've introduced you to the chimpanzee Samantha here at the zoo. Uh, Samantha, generally speaking, doesn't like very many people at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, she really dislikes most people. Um, for whatever reason, she really likes me. And there's a sense of, gosh, there's like a connection there. There's a bond. When I see her, I get happy. She sees me. She gets happy. We hoot and pan hoot to each other. Just <laughs> and she does the same thing. And I know it sounds kind of corny. It just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It really does. She seems to to know my feelings for her or that I really care about that animal. I want her to be as comfortable, as happy as possible. Um, and I feel that she feels the same way with me. Um, so that's one animal. Another animal that people would not necessarily think can show any kind of affection, and not that he shows affection, but it's Goliath, the Galapagos tortoise, a 525 pound tortoise that is over 100 years old. He just hears my voice and his head goes up like a periscope and he comes walking at me as fast as he can. I mean, it's tortoise warp drive, but it's, you know, somewhat slow. But the fact that he comes at me as soon as he can follows my voice and it just comes right up waiting for me to scratch his neck. I tell you, that's just a really, really good feeling. Um, you know, they're a giraffe. I think you've been here with me too, Dan, where I call their names. They'll be on the other side of the exhibit and, and I'll call their names. And I make these crazy sounds when I call their names and they 
perk up and they come walking right over. And even the people at the draft feeding station will say, gosh, you know, we've been calling them all morning. They don't pay any attention to us. And, and they come over. Now, I realize that a lot of this is their association with me and my association with food. Every time they see me, I usually have something that they really like. Um, so I'm not trying to kid myself. But there are times when I try to say, well, you know, maybe it's also me too. Uh, and that, that makes me feel special. And it's the same thing with the elephants. But the number one, the number one moment I will never forget is when I first started here, there was a tigress, her name was Natasha. And whenever, for whatever reason, whenever she saw me, she would chuff. It was a, it's a happy sound in tigers where they look at you and they kind of go. <laughs> and that is a calming thing. And I would see her back in our holding area in the night house and she would come right up, right up to the barrier there to me. She'd go, <laughs> and I go, <laughs> and she'd rub up against the bars. And, you know, there was a feeling I said, gosh, I wish I could almost go in there and want to just scratch her back. Of course, I would have been stupid, but I thought there was a special bond there. And that was cemented the day she had her cubs. First time ever. First time mom cubs. She had her cubs back in the den. And I tell you, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I went up right up to the enclosure and she was back in the den and she saw me and she grabbed her cubs in her mouth and she walked out and placed them right in front of me for me to see them and laid down and just chuffed as if, I know this sounds anthropomorphic. I know the people are going to say, oh, Ryan, you know, you're being stupid. It's, a, you know, it's just coincidence, whatever. She laid down there and she chuffed and she showed me her newborn cubs. And anyone who's worked with these animals, you know, the maternal instinct is incredibly protective of their cubs. Um, a tiger, generally speaking, would never let you get close to her cubs. And yet she brought them out to me, laid down, kind of closed her eyes and chuffed with her cubs there right in front of me. It's a moment I will remember for the every last breath I have. Did you cry? I, did. I how, did. How often has an animal moved you from happiness? I know you grieve when you lose them, but how, how often does that happen? Um, you know, happiness in that animals recover from things. Uh, Samantha is one of those animals. She was an animal that uh, had gotten really, really sick. Um, and the veterinarians called and asked if I would come back there. You know, just like uh, you have a family member in a hospital bed that's really, really sick. Uh, sometimes it's good that they see family members that helps lift their spirits. And they thought, well, maybe because everybody was aware of Samantha's bond with me, that if she saw me, she would feel better. And she had been literally in kind of a fetal position in the corner of her enclosure, just not moving, not saying anything. And when I went back there and I just kind of went, oh, oh, she looked at me oh, 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 and she came right over and put her, presented her back for me to groom her back. And, you know, she literally, that was kind of like the beginning of her rebounding from this illness that she had, of which she's made a full, full recovery, thank goodness after that. But, you know, moments like that make me cry that, uh, that you could have uh, an impact on an animal like that. Um, and, and I, you know, you, you'll see countless examples of that on YouTube, on, on the internet of people reconnecting with an animal they haven't seen for years. Uh, and yet that animal remembers, you know, that's the thing about animals. There's a pure honesty about them. Um, and, and a memory that people don't give them, you know, we always hear about the memory of an elephant. I think a lot of animals remember things that we don't give them credit for. Ron, the same way that good animals are attracted to good people, is it possible that bad animals sense that energy and are attracted to bad people? <laughs> no, you, know, you know, Billy, the, 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 I know Dan's laughing. It may sound a little bit of a, an extreme no, opposite. It's like an there, evil internship I, program. I think, I think that's possible. And I think just like people, there are bad animals. There are animals, especially the more intelligent the animal, depending on how it was raised, there can be animals that have malice in their in their minds and, 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 and are aggressive for no other reason other than being aggressive, again, as a result of whatever their upbringing was. You know, I, I say that all animals are reflections of how they were raised. Um, in the pure world where we don't have poachers, where we don't have people, you know, abusing animals, uh, generally speaking, you don't find those kinds of bad animals. But like in a chimp society, which is like a human society, there are thugs, okay? There are gang members. What? That, oh, yeah. There's no question about those it. Animal gangs? You know, animal gangs. Absolutely. Wow. What are they called? They create these, these cliques, these gangs that can be, you know, very disruptive to the rest of the troop, can be uh, flat out dangerous to the rest of the troop. And those gangs will perpetuate that behavior to future generations. So you see that. Uh, you know, I don't want to come across like, oh, all animals are these pure Disney wonderful animals and they don't mean any harm at all. It's not that. I'm saying under ideal circumstances, when animals are raised under uh, uh, normal, beautiful, natural circumstances, yes, they may have struggles. And yes, they could be dangerous because they don't understand what you represent. But there isn't that malice that you'll see that can be learned from growing up in a culture 
that is passed down from whatever, you know, wherever they were raised. So yes, bad animals could be um, attracted to bad people, uh, to bad behaviors. Scar from Lion King, bad egg. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, the hyenas. Well, well, no, the hyena, no, the hyena's got a bad rap in Lion King. I gotta tell you, hyenas are really whoa, cool whoa, animals. Whoa. No, hyenas are cool animals. Not in the Lion King, Disney, Ron. Disney screwed up. Okay, what do you because mean? they screwed up in that film because Be they careful. gave hyenas I've got, a really I've bad got, like label. non non disparagement agreement. Be careful here, please. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm serious. They, they, they the evil not... laugh, Ron. Careful, Ron. Yeah, that laugh, Ron. <laughs> guys. I, I guys, don't care. They can sue me. Scar's a real asshole. <laughs> yeah, Ron. <laughs> I said it. Come at me. Run. Put, it, Scar, put it on the poll. Scar, Where's Scar an asshole? Scar and Foss are like one of those like nature versus nurture things, right? Because mm. they came from the same parents and they turned out so differently. Why is that? Because what Disney did was they um, they basically well, what's the the, 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 the play there. Macbeth? No, not Macbeth. Well, what is the play? It's the Shakespeare play. They they basically did with animals. Okay, where well, the brothers were against each other. What is that play? You guys know it. You're more culturally. Whatever. Is it Macbeth? You're asking me, Ron. I don't know. I don't know what. I'm not no. familiar. It's Hamlet. You're, you're, uh, there it is. Hamlet. Oh, Hamlet, of course. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Sue. No, you're Shakespeare. <laughs> Thank there you. you. Go. There you go. So, you know, listen, they, 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 they anthropomorphized those animals and they made the bad guys versus the good guys. Um, but at the end of the day, they really did a disservice to an animal that deserves respect credibility the hyenas are incredible animals that play a very important role and they don't necessarily go after little lion cubs even though they will take one out if they get the opportunity the worst animal you've had at the zoo when you say you've had bad animals is there one above all others in the history of the zoo where you're like this one geez, geez, just incorrigible like will not behave um it's not a matter of behaving it's just there was a level of aggression in the animal it was a tiger uh that was here um that was you know we knew we knew that if that tiger were ever to get access to somebody, he would, he would kill them instantly. He was an incredibly aggressive tiger, a male, big male, very territorial, very defensive of the, of the area that he lived in. And, uh, you know, you, you didn't even hesitate to think for one moment that, uh, you know, he wouldn't be so bad. No, 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 no. That, that I remember that tiger very well. As a matter of fact, I would get shivers up my spine when I walked by the front of the exhibit and the way he looked at me across the moat, um, that was something that would, uh, yeah, it would put the fear of God in me. Not to bring it back to the Lion King, but just to close the loop. So hyenas <laughs> got a bad rap because they don't attack lions, but they would attack lions if they could attack lions. Hyenas will fight lions to try to get food, um, but they don't, they're not just scavengers. In other words, uh, you know, there are times when a hyena makes a kill and it's eating and lions come and beat the crap out of the hyena and the hyena runs away because he doesn't have enough backup. And there are times when one lioness may make a kill and there's a whole clan of hyenas and they'll go in there and say, you know what? Tit for tat. And they'll go in there and, and chase that lioness off the food to get the food. But it's not they want to kill the lioness. They want to remove the lioness as a form of competition. It's all about competition, survival of the fittest. What I'm saying is they're both adept predators. Uh, they both deserve respect in their own way. Um, but yeah, yeah, to your point, a hyena will kill a lion if it has the opportunity. But lions will also kill a hyena if they have an opportunity. So what makes one worse than the other? Guillermo also put on the poll, do you know why it's tit for tat? Do you know oh, what those things <laughs> are and what that means? I've got two more questions before we get you out of here. You mentioned anthropomorphic and the idea that what? the chimp perhaps would be uh, you know, food interested or any of these relationships would be food interested. But you also made the point there are plenty of that that same chimp. Other people have food and that chimp's not nice to those people who have food. Correct. Like it's not it's not just food. In your case, you've seen something else, a different behavior. That's a good point. No, you're, you're right, Dan. There are people that that chimp hates, whether they have food or not. Um, and and whether I have food or not, uh, she seems to love me. Um, she doesn't get necessarily disappointed when she sees me and I don't have food. Um, whereas, you know, she'll throw crap at other people. Um, she, she, she really, it's a special animal. Special Actually animal. throws feces at other people. Um, well, I don't know about feces, but rocks and whatever she can get a hold of. And let's close this out. And again, a reminder, this man cares deeply about the animals. You know this already after all these years, but also across the decades, but also he is someone who 
no bureaucracy. The money that you donate gets to care for the animals without any interference. So support his endowment where and if you can. Close us out with the sound that you make for the giraffes to come running over. <laughs> I just kind of call her name. I kind of go, Lizard! Lizard! Come on, Blizzard, Mia! Come on, Mia! Come on, Mia! Just like that. So it's a way that nobody else can really look like an idiot doing it. So they immediately associate that. I'm, I'm glad that was entertaining for you. Guys. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. He speaks to the animals. He's a modern day Tarzan. Also, Mike Ryan left the studio while you were talking because he's uh, Metal Ark is now in negotiations for the movie rights of a pet that you uh, take a zipper and a child is inside. A little dog. Uh, we're in talks with Marlon Wayans right now, actually. Is that the running yeah, title? That, I don't know what the title is going to be yet, but we're in negotiations. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. See you, Ron.